Hey everyone, so I'm here to talk to you about latency. Um, and this phenomenon that I think might ring true for a lot of you, where computers are really fast and getting faster every time you buy a new one, but they don't actually feel any faster, and maybe they even feel slower. Um, and so specifically, I want to talk about what I would have called input latency before writing this talk, and will now realize is maybe not the best term, but looking at the moment-to-moment -moment experience of pressing a key or clicking a mouse or touching a touch screen and seeing something happen rather than sort of broader scale things. Um, and I want to figure out sort of why, why that's the case. Um, spoiler alert, I can't solve that in 10 minutes, uh, but I can give you a sort of conceptual framework in which you might understand how to find the solution. Um, and I can also help you understand why this is really important, because it is really important. Um, so why is it important? Um, if you work in e-commerce or in advertising, uh, you have likely had a product manager or been the product manager who likes to hammer on about how page load time is super important. Um, Google did some research in 2009 about how adding a couple hundred milliseconds to page load meant that people did, on average, 0.5% fewer searches, um, which that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're Google, that is a lot of absolute searches. Um, but I also assume, uh, if you're here at Bang Bang Con, maybe I'm misreading the room, but you probably don't really care about micro-optimizing ad click-through rates. Um, I don't know. Uh, but you probably do care about the effectiveness of computers as tools for augmenting human cognition. Um, where it turns out this is really important for that too. Um, there's been a lot of research over the years, uh, like this video here is Microsoft doing some work with uh, touchscreen latency. Um, but like a lot of numbers that you see going back to the 80s and earlier um, about sort of in broad strokes, anything under 50 milliseconds of latency feels more or less instant. Um, anything less than 100 milliseconds, you can notice it, but it still feels quote unquote instant. Um, above 250 milliseconds, which we'll, we'll see this number over and over again, um, things start getting a little more problematic. Um, so there's this great game designer named Steve Swink who wrote a phenomenal textbook called Game Feel that if you want to design sort of real timey games, you should read it. Um, but he has this example of grabbing a muffin as this sort of real time control system. Um, where if you're just reaching out with your hand to grab a muffin, like it seems easy, you don't think about it, but there is this complex process where you move your hand a little bit, you perceive the world and say, oh, I need to adjust a bit, and you move your hand a little more, and you go back and forth until you have grabbed and hopefully started eating a muffin. Um, this also happens when you use tools that are not your hands. Uh, but once you reach the sort of 250 millisecond threshold, that real-time feedback loop breaks down. And even though like, you as a conscious thinking human are smart enough to know, like when I press this button, the thing still happens even though it happens slowly, um, the lizard part of your brain might not realize that. Um, and so things that happen that slowly for the sort of moment-to-moment -moment interaction, you are actually going to be a dumber person and dumber user of this tool because of that latency, which is ridiculous. Like we are, we are talking about hard, measurable numbers, uh, but we also have this much fuzzier sense of how is your brain responding to stimuli. Um, there's a lot of other research that supports this. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about other levels of research. Like Jacob Nielsen is a uh, very well-known HCI researcher and starts to talk more about well, all right, at what point does your brain start to consciously wander? Like, and you, you as a conscious person, start losing attention and yeah. Uh, but I'm, I want to focus more on the actual moment-to-moment -moment stuff right now that I have been. Um, so this sort of rabbit hole for me into this problem space uh, came by way of a game I was working on. Um, I had been building a company to make these local multiplayer video games uh, where you go to a website on your phone and your phone's the controller. Um, you might have played games like this. They usually tend to be trivia games or turn-based games or something slow. Uh, we hated ourselves, so we were making twitchy action games. Um, which, as you can expect, that is a really hard design and engineering problem of how do you make this WebSocket packet that goes all the way over the internet and into another computer feel as responsive and juicy as pressing a physical button on a wired controller. Uh, but so we took our prototype and we showed it around, and one of the game designers we showed it to, their response was, oh, like this is, as a designer, this is great, this is low latency enough that most people aren't going to notice it. Um, However, like as a competitive Street Fighter player, this is nowhere near low latency enough. You could not play Street Fighter on this. Um, which is ridiculous, because that points to this is not just about the fuzzy subjective nature of how you're reacting to it, but even as a person using a computer, this is going to differ based on the task you're trying to do. Um, which intuitively makes sense if we think back to the Microsoft research from a few slides ago. Um, they found that with touch screens, you care more about latency on the order of 10 or 20 milliseconds. 
Um, John Carmack talks a lot about VR, where that number is closer to 20 milliseconds than 50, which also makes sense because you're trying to convince your eyes that you're in a physical space you're not. Um, but so we really need to think about the context of what are we trying to do here. Um, which is all great. We know that this matters and it is weird and complex and tricky. But how do we actually do something about it? If we want to do something about it, we have to measure it. If we want to measure it, we have to know what it is. Um, and we're not really looking at just this input latency of how long it takes for the button press to register. We are looking at this whole feedback cycle where the player does something, the computer interprets it, responds, displays some information, and the, and the player or user in, interprets that data. Um, so through the next four or five minutes, I'm going to walk through sort of one, one step of this feedback loop of how do we actually figure out like, what actually happens when you try to interact with a computer. Um, so we're going to look at this example of a human simple response test. This is a thing you see cited pretty often when looking into this sort of work. Um, it's a very simple test to figure out how quickly can you respond to things. Uh, when you click to this to start, a red box will turn green. When it turns green, let's say you're going to press a key on the keyboard. Um, and then it'll say, great, it took you 200 milliseconds to respond. Um, so how, what happens from when that thing turns green to when it tells you it took 200 milliseconds? Um, well, to start with, there is a human in there, and that human also has latency. Um, it takes you time to figure out, well, how do you visually perceive something? Once you have perceived it, how do you process it and figure out what to do with it? And then once you know you want to tell your hand to press a keyboard key, what do you actually, how do you actually make that happen? Um, this 250 millisecond number comes back. Uh, you see this in a lot of different research studies. This specific one I was looking at was from Xerox Park Research in the early 80s, because of course it was. Um, <laughs> but it also seems like if you, like that number will also be different if you're a 21-year-old college student or an Olympic athlete, you can probably get down to 180 or 190 milliseconds for this sort of like visual simple response test. Um, but once you have pressed the keyboard key, what actually happens? This also takes a whole bunch of time. Um, and this, like that previous step, this isn't really that reliant on the, the progress of technology. Um, if you're going to physically press a keyboard key, that's going to take time to depress. That's going to take different time based on whether it's a new MacBook keyboard with zero key travel or a big <laughs> clicky mechanical keyboard switch that takes you tens of milliseconds. Um, you might have to deal with reaction time. If you have ever like, built your own mechanical keyboard, you know that you don't have 108 I.O. pins going into your keyboard. You have a two-dimensional matrix that you have to scan typically at 100 hertz or 1,000 hertz. So that might add some time, probably not. You have to deal with bounce and debouncing because making sure that you actually respect like, how many times the user pressed the keyboard key is important. There might be some USB shenanigans. Um, I've saw widely ranging values for these. Um, the numbers, the 15 to 60 milliseconds, come from Dan Liu, who is a really, really smart person who sort of vaguely in the bang bang con recurse centery ecosystem. Um, and he did a bunch of very, very good empirical tests with a phone camera taking video at 240 frames per second to measure, well, how long does it take a bunch of different keyboards to respond? Um, and that's how he came up with these numbers. Um, we'll see that approach of very, very fast cameras coming up again and again of how do you actually measure this. Um, but all right, so then it's got into the computer. And here's where things get fuzzier and harder to measure. Um, some of the rendering pipeline stuff can be pretty straightforward. Um, like your window manager might do some compositing that takes some extra time. Maybe some of the way your GPU is buffering things will take some time. Um, but that's simpler than the sort of intersection of the operating system and your application code, um, where I'm sure a lot of you have written code that measures code you've written and figures out how fast it takes to do something. Um, but again, Dan Liu wrote a wonderful blog post that I misspelled up there, um, looking at how long it takes for a uh, different, different terminals on Mac OS to respond to keyboard commands. Um, again, with the same sort of 240 frames per second camera setup. And it turned out like a relevant stat wasn't just how long does it take to work, but how long does it take to work under different CPU loads. And you can imagine different operating systems are going to have different strategies for managing CPU load and how that gives processing time to different processes, et cetera. So this is a little weird. Um, but then finally, you get to the screen itself. Uh, we're going to skip over screen refresh for a second. Um, if you're using a computer monitor, your display lag is probably zero. It could be way higher for TVs. If you play games, you may have turned on gaming mode, which can help with that. Um, if you're a competitive Smash Brothers player, you use a CRT, because that's going to have lower display lag. Um, it can also actually take a couple milliseconds to change, physically change the colors of the pixels once they've been drawn. Um, but the weird thing here is, is screen refresh and vSync. So your average screen runs at 60 hertz, so it updates 60 times a second. 
which means every update takes about 16 or 17 milliseconds. Um, and typically, in a lot of cases, you'll have vsync on, which means you're not going to run, you're not going to update until uh, the whole thing is ready to go. So you're not, if you draw something at time equals 16 and time equals 18, if you're rendering at time equals 0 and 17 and 34, they're not going to be rendered they're going to be rendered 17 milliseconds apart, um, which is also a problem with games. Games typically update at a 60 frames per second update rate. Um, I'm out of time, so I'm going to get through this really quickly. Um, but so like if you're looking at Smash Brothers and you're measuring input latency of different types of controllers, which some people on YouTube did with the exact same sort of 240 frames per second camera, um, you'll notice the average latency of a wired GameCube controller over a USB hub versus a Pro controller is like seven milliseconds. Um, but because that happens across the frame boundary, that's actually 17 milliseconds of latency different, um, which means like we can't even just talk about controller input latency as its own thing, because that is deeply complicated and intersected and complected with the actual application code and what latency that is adding. So this is actually way too complicated to even think about in context of this happens, and this happens, and this happens. Um, but at least we made it to the end. So thanks. <laughs>